Okay, I think we're ready to get going. Again, let me do a little bit of introduction. My name is State Representative Jeff Kiker, and joining me today is my peer, Representative Tom Demmer. Um, and we're gonna share with you some great tips and tricks with uh, applying for jobs, preparing resumes, and, and things that you should be on the lookout for. And, and frankly, I think that's imp more important now than it has been in, in quite a while with what we see going on in the uh, jobs world. So um, with that, I wanna, I wanna talk a little bit real quick about the importance of jobs. Both Tom and I have worked aggressively uh, during the past two years uh, at making sure that we have good, solid job opportunities for people in uh, the DeKalb, Ogle, Kane, Boone, LaSalle County areas um, to really kind of drive home some of the opportunities that are going on in the, in the wider economy. Um, originally, what we had looked at is we had looked at hosting a job fair at Kishwaukee College, um, but unfortunately in the, these COVID times, we were unable to do so. So this is our, our replacement for that. So do look for it next year. We will be doing that again. Um, and with that, I'd like to hand it over to my, my peer, Representative Tom Demmer. Hey, thanks a lot, Jeff. Uh, good morning, everybody. I'm uh, Tom Demmer, I represent um, Lee Ogle, DeKalb, and LaSalle counties uh, in the Illinois House of Representatives and have a district that's just, just to the west of, of Jeff's district. And so he and I are happy to team up today to be able to offer um, what we think is a really important resource for uh, the current world that we're in. You know, a lot of the, as Jeff mentioned, a lot of the in-person events have had to be postponed or rescheduled, uh, but there have been some opportunities like we have today where we're able to do some things virtually uh, to help get you the resources information that you need. We know that the landscape today for jobs and employment is as unpredictable and uh, new as ever. Uh, there are so many things that have, that have changed about uh, the types of jobs that are available and the circumstances that every individual or in their family has about what jobs they're um, able to take. And so whether you're looking to find work um, or considering options for uh, what you might be able to do to change the job that you have, the resources and the information that our uh, guest is going to share with you today, I think are gonna be very important for you. And so we're, uh, we're really uh, honored and, and uh, lucky to have uh, leading this presentation today um, a, a woman who's worked in a variety of uh, local organizations to help prepare people to get jobs, to help them build the kind of resources and skills they need to be able to, to, to land a solid job. Um, and she's going to be to share that with us this morning. And so uh, to turn it over to, to get our presentation underway, uh, joining us is Linda Kojan from the DeKalb Workforce Development, from Illinois WorkNet, from Kishwaukee College. Uh, Linda, your, your, your own resume goes on and on. And so we're, we're very uh, pleased to have you join us. And uh, we look forward to the skills and to the resources that you're going to be able to share with us this morning. So I'll turn it over to our host, uh, Linda Kojan. Linda? Well, thank you very much for having me today. I'm excited to be here. Um, again, I work with the Illinois WorkNet Center here in DeKalb. We call it the DeKalb Workforce Development Office. I'm also a part of Kishwaukee College. We are WIOA, Workforce Innovation and Opportunities Act Services. So we help people with job placement. Um, I'm the employer services specialist. So my responsibility is to help get people directly networked to employers in the community and make those connections, as well as we can provide training grants up to $10,000 to help people reach their career and professional goals. So um, a little brief about me, I've been employer services. I interviewed for my first job coach job on 9-11-01 <laughs> and I've been helping people with um, achieve their employment goals either through disability services or general population services um, since then. And so I, I joke that I am a big nerd for helping people figure out what they wanna be when they grow up. So <laughs> I'm very excited to be here today. Um, I'm going to try to share my screen and start my presentation here. Hopefully everybody can see that. Um, I got some nods. Yeah, thank you. Um, so we're going to discuss today standout resumes and networking your way to a new job. So um, there we go. Topics. Okay, so we're going to review kind of resume types because there are different types of resumes. So resumes are a critical marketing material for you. So picking the right type is kind of the essential first step. So how are you going to market yourself the best? 
um, tricks to overcome writer's block, networking and employment connections, digital networking and community involvement, and a little brief video if we have time, um, just to kind of demonstrate thinking outside the box and how you can be essential. Okay, so resume types. Um, there are three basic types of resumes, um, two that are most popularly used. The first one is kind of the gold standard chronological resume. This resume is organized by date. Your newest employment or current employment is going to be on the top. Um, there's an individual job description for each position that you've held. Um, this is really ideal for individuals that have built a career kind of in one area or have work experience um, in the field that they're trying to move up in. Um, so using the chronological resume for those types of situations. Um, and I'm hoping you guys can see this okay, but this is actually my resume. <laughs> um, and I have included it here with my work information. Um, but uh, it, it is a chronological resume showing how you can kind of build that career. Um, going back to my first job kind of in career services back with Ben Gordon Center and how I have moved up with uh, WIA at the time with First Institute and then I was at Opportunity House for 11 years and then now I'm back with Kishwaukee College as the Employer Services Specialist um, working for WIA uh, and just kind of showing how I moved through my career um, over time. My education is towards the bottom and later we'll talk about kind of how organizing sets that all up. Um, again, it's the newest on top. So I was honored to be in the Sycamore Leadership Academy in 2019. I have some graduate coursework. And um, this objective up here is actually the, the objective I submitted for the position that I'm in now. So I got the job. <laughs> um, but I, I included Kishwaukee Community College on there just to show that I am an alumni and, and kind of toot that horn a little bit. So. Um, and then I have on my page too, some certifications. Um, I'm certified case manager. I'm also CPR and first aid certified. And then I do some local community coaching. So I coach swimming currently. Um, and then prior to that, I also had the honor of coaching the Colorado Sycamore High School for 10 years. So um, it shows my community involvement that I can work with kids, that I can work with adults, people with disabilities, um, and, and that I'm very involved in the community. So the second type of resume, well, second and third, but they're very interrelated. So a functional resume is where you're highlighting your skill set. Um, a true functional resumes are for people that do not have real documented paid work experience. Think your high school students or maybe college students that are um, maybe had one job or done babysitting or just kind of odds and ends lawn mowing. That usually it's the student population that uses a functional resume to show what their skills are as opposed to highlighting their work history. A combination resume is basically a functional resume on top and a chronological resume on the bottom. It takes the skills associated with the employment, but it organizes it in a different way so that your skills are highlighted independent from the position that you've done that task at. This is really great for people that are looking to make a change because you can identify and highlight your transferable skills that you'd be bringing to the new position. It also really helps if you have substantial gaps of employment because you're able to um, highlight those skills in, in the present tense and it's not associated with a specific time frame. So um, I'm gonna show you, this is actually, I changed his name, but this is a friend of mine's resume. And a little bit about um, him, he had a grandfather that passed away in Poland in about 2004, if I'm remembering correctly, and left his estate to him. And he had to move to Poland for two years to settle the family estate. So prior to having to move, he was a graphic designer and a software engineer and in the tech industry. And as a lot of you can probably assume, the tech industry is very fast moving. So when you're out of it for two years, you get passed over for a lot of jobs. So when he came back, he started working for the Taekwondo school and did their office stuff and all of their web promotions. Um, but what does the Taekwondo instructor want to be a graphic designer? 
So he was constantly just being passed up for interviews and, and not getting the job. So we took his skills away from his work history and we really organized it. Um, and we have his technical skills first because that really highlighted what he wanted to do and what he wanted to focus at. We organized it so and, and, and selected verbiage. So you'll see like well versed in Adobe Illustrator, After Effects, Image Ready, Photoshop. So those are the, the graphic design um, program specifically. We chose fluent as our, our key verb there. Um, so fluent and COBOL, C++, those are all computer languages. And then competent in Advantage Data Server, Fox Pro. So we're using that for database applications. So we just really grouped all of those things. So where he didn't do those skills in one, like in just the most recent job, he can do those and bring those skills to the table. Um, and then we have his professional skills, which is kind of what did he use his technical skills to do? And then his customer relations, which is helping people. I really like this um, format of a resume because also you can change the order that your accomplishment headings are in. So if he was going for something that was maybe more customer driven or like IT help desk, we could take those customer relations skills, cut and paste, move it to the top, and it changes the whole tone of this overall resume. So it's really easy to customize a combination resume and get it to fit the job that you're going for, which is something we'll be talking more about soon. Um, so resume components, how they can help you, and you need to have a really good understanding of them. So we're gonna talk about a, the difference between an objective and a professional summary, heading orders, and should your resume be one page? Okay, so objectives and professional summaries. So I have an example on the screen here of each um, thing. So the one on the left is our objective. So um, I don't have a name for this person, but an administrative assistant with over five years of experience managing business office functions and providing executive level support to principals and clients, seeking to apply my detail-oriented talents and adaptable personality to fulfill the company's needs, possesses a BA in English and is bilingual in English and Chinese. So she is stating basically this is what I have and what I hope to do and, and bring to the table for your company. So she's stating an objective statement. Over here on the right, we have um, what I call a professional summary. So I'm, I'm actually gonna click on that and hopefully this works and I can zoom in a little bit and move down. Um, so dedicated customer service manager with extensive experience in big box retail and food service settings, consistently achieve high uh, record high customer satisfaction rankings, improvements to the bottom line and turnaround for underperforming operations. And then she has these bulleted points, customer service management, complaint resolution, retail operations management. So she's going through and she's giving you these kind of two word, one, one point bullets of the things that she can do. And then she goes on and then has more specifics to her positions down here. But this really is just a bulleted highlight section. Um, and what I like to do is kind of think about my long bulleted points and try to put it in one word. And that's how I come up with these professional summary bullet points. Um, these are also really helpful because a lot of companies are using digital resume readers to kind of screen their applicants. So they're, what those screeners are often looking for are key words. And so having this sort of a format helps you to get past those a little bit. Um, certainly other formats of resumes, the regular chronological, you wanna make sure that you're using somewhat industry specific language or at least those key points so that you do stand out. Um, okay, let's go back here to PowerPoint. Okay, so um, objectives. They state, what job are you applying for? What skills do you bring to the table? And what do you hope to gain from the position? So you're answering those three questions with your objective statement. They're used best when you're going for a specific position at a specific job. So again, my objective was to obtain the employer services position at, at Kishwaukee College. Um, 
and so I am specifically stating the position, usually for the company that I'm going for, or at the very least, a specific industry or career area. Um, it should expand upon your cover letter, and sometimes they don't ask for a cover letter. It really depends on the individual job and the level of the position. Um, so, but we want to kind of summarize your cover letter with your objective statement and really highlight those um, key points. Try to be unique. I often ask myself, why am I applying for this position? What gets my heart excited about it? Why, why do I want to throw my hat into the ring? So by stating you know, what you're hoping to do and bring to the position, it should be the things that you like and you're most passionate about. Professional summaries, again, are kind of better used for general resumes. They can be um, like your LinkedIn profile. They can be passed out at job fairs if you if there's an employer you were not aware that was there. Um, you can give them to your references and your support team, which we'll talk about later. And they're just kind of your more general format resumes. Um, I put on here, use the ONET. If you search ONET, the, um, ONET is the digital version of the Occupational Outlook Handbook. Um, but it can give you a lot of really good information. So if you kind of type up your generic job title, it'll give you an excellent job description of the key points of, and responsibilities for that position. So um, that's one way that you can use for wording and get ideas of industry-specific language is to kind of borrow from the own that job description. Don't cut and paste, but summarize. Um, the professional summaries, are, again, are great for getting past those online screening tools because you're using those bullet point words that are hopefully going to match to the keywords you're looking for. Um, and then it can be used on any format of resume. So you can include your professional summary on top of your chronological or on top of a functional. So how you organize your resume helps you market yourself. So. If you're a recent graduate, or maybe you got a degree or a credential that makes you qualified or meets a job requirement, sometimes it's good to have your education section on basically the top of your resume underneath your professional summary or objective. Um, we read something top to bottom, left to right. And so you want to put what I call the meat and potatoes, the best information in those top two quadrants. So the top left and the top right. That should be the stuff that you want to jump out at you, out at your reader the most. The stuff that you kind of want to minimize or camouflage, if it's dates or um, limited experience, for example, um, that would you want to put that more towards the bottom or the stuff that isn't essential to know. It's the nice to knows versus the need to knows. So pick, think of a read your resume. Um, First, top to bottom, left to right. Are you organized well? Are you highlighting your skills? And are you prioritizing things in that way? So it's the stuff that you want to show off first on top. Um, and then also read your resume from the bottom to the top because good HR managers are going to read the resume that way first because they're knowing that that's kind of a trick. So any mistakes are going to show up better. Any inconsistencies are going to show up better when you go from the bottom to the top, because you're actually thinking about it more when you're reading it somewhat backwards. So make sure when you're writing your resume that you read it both ways. The one page conundrum. Okay, so as I showed in my example, my resume is actually two pages, um, but the second page is that nice to know information. It's my, my professional certifications and my community involvement which is very important to my resume, but not necessarily the one thing that makes me stand out for that particular position. So if for some reason you can't submit more than one page or you got separated and you weren't able to print front to back, that sort of thing, it's a logical cutoff at the end of my education. So my first page can stand alone. There are some human resources people that are very firm that their resume should always be one page, but I think kind of for the most part the opinion is shifting, but it should be that your resume, the majority of your content should fit on the first page. It should have a logical cutoff 
and um, be really clean. The other alternatives to that, if you, real, if you really have like a good, solid, long work history that goes back a long ways, or you have a lot of things that you want to say, is you can create something called an addendum, which you can do sort of a layering effect, where your resume, the first page, has the most important, the best, your favorite information on it. On the bottom, you add addendum available upon request. And then you create a second document that says addendum. And basically, it's the stuff that didn't fit on your resume, and that can be as long as you would like it to be. And then you would bring that in your interview and offer to supply the addendum in an interview situation so they have the rest of that information. Um, or you can label something a curriculum vitae or a CV. And that is really used most often in the educational setting. Sometimes I've seen it in like engineering or really professional science related positions. But a CV is really anything you've ever done. So think about a professor who is going to have things that are published or um, performing studies and, and doing research. Um, and they really want to include all of those notations they've done for their whole professional career or participate in a lot of trainings. Um, so a CV is really everything you've ever done your entire work history. And those are usually a small book. But that's OK to have that available. Some people really like to know more. And then I've included this checklist, and I can send this. If anybody would like it, I'll have my email at the end, and I will happily send it to you. But this is just a really good checklist to kind of work through once you've done your resume. So does it not look like a template? Is it not in Word where, um, with one of the templates where you can't adjust your, your sections and the formatting? Um, does it look professional? Um, are all sections labeled clearly? Again, I would encourage you to review, are your sections ordered in a way that represent you the absolute best? Is your work history in the reverse chronological order? Um, and it should be your newest job on top. Um, is the career objective included? And do you have like a good headline or do you have a professional summary section? You know, just really going through, are you checking all of these boxes? And the last thing I like to do is read the job description. And if it says that it needs somebody to do X, Y, and Z, does my resume demonstrate that I can do X, Y, Z, that I am the person for the job without a doubt, that I'm able to, to tackle this and, and would be a good fit. You can use job descriptions to help you with your wording. Um, if they're saying they're looking for this and you can do that, you should state it. If it's important enough to be on the job description, it's going to be something you're doing a lot of. So if you have experience, you want to highlight that. And if you don't, what experience do you have that directly relates to it? So that way you can highlight, even if you haven't done the exact responsibility, you've probably done something along those lines. So you're able to grow and develop in your position. Okay. So now we're going to move on to networking. I know I kind of went through resumes quick, but um, we're going to move on a little bit to networking, which kind of involves some resume stuff as well. So, but we're going to talk a little bit about the people you know and how you can use them to your advantage. Um, digital marketing and getting out in the community and being involved and how you can demonstrate that you are essential. Okay, so the people you know. I love this little flowchart, and I would encourage you to either print this one off or make little bubbles on a piece of paper somewhere or have a little dry erase board, whatever works well for you. But basically, the people you know can help you grow in your position already. Chances are you've encountered somebody in your career path that has similar skills and expertise to you. They may be a friend. It may be somebody you go to church with. It may be a former coworker. So you're going to put you here in the middle. And this one has space for four direct contacts. These are the people that are in your inner circle. So these are going to be the people that you know fairly well, almost basically usually your references, your professional references, is where you're going to look to start. So you're going to have person one, two, three, and four. When you're networking, you want to let people know that you're hoping to expand in your career and your profession. I like to get my resume into their hands. 
them and let them have a copy of it so they know what I'm trying to highlight myself professionally. Make sure that you are LinkedIn profile friends and social media friends with these individuals. And this is gonna be your first go-to. And then in a conversation, I like to ask them specifically, do you know anybody that would be good for me to know? Um, do you know anybody that would be a good resource or helpful um, that works in my chosen career field or may know of an opportunity? They don't have to know of a job necessarily. What you're really looking to do is plant the seed. So you're looking to build your contacts, your network, um, and your friendship so that later on when we discuss many hands make the light work, you're, you're building your, your team, your tribe to help you achieve your goals. So, Person number one thinks of two people that may be able to help you. Person number two gives you two more. And soon you see here that it just grows exponentially. So honestly, with starting with your four contacts, if they give this person gave you three, this gave you two, this total leads to 18 new contacts just from your four. And, and that's, you know, at two levels. It's not really going out that far. Um, and I really think it's important to map it out and kind of keep track as to who told you about who and how you know somebody. So that if this person leads you to that dream job or actually hires you, you can then go in your uplink of connections and send thank you notes because you never know in the future when somebody else is going to want to help you. Okay. Again, I like to provide my resume to those initial contacts and really anybody that, that is going to help you along the way so they know how you're marketing yourself and a little bit more about you. Also, ask for letters of recommendation from your references or people that you think are going to have a good representation of your work ethic and what you've done in the past. Um, good former coworkers, supervisors, teachers, professors, community connections, ministers friends. Um, lots of people can see you in action and say good things and having those letters of recommendation in one spot um, helps really in, a, in an interview situation you have them available to provide. A lot of social services uh, positions and, and nonprofit organizations really do rely on references still to kind of help them with their decision making. So you're getting it all ready to go in advance um, and, and getting your, your tribe built. Keep your contacts updated. I recommend monthly or if there is some sort of really great progress that you can directly attribute to them, give them an email, a quick phone call, anything, just to let them know what's going on. And when you land that job and you're no longer looking, also let them know. If you think that they may be calling for a reference, it's really a good idea to give them a heads up and kind of talk to them about the position so that they know how to help market you. Again, we're planting the seed for the future. So just as you grow professionally, so will your network and the people you know and the impression that you make. Digital marketing. So this is where I'm going to come off a little bit like a stalker and I don't intend to. Um, and I say that jokingly, but digital marketing right now is really essential. Um, and especially with everything with COVID, and people needing to do webinars and everything is behind a computer, classes, job interviews, everything now is digital. Digital, your digital presence is even more important now than ever. Um, so we want to find that personal touch that helps set you apart in your job search. So websites such as LinkedIn, you can actually search like a company name and then take a look at people who say that they work there. And a lot of people will say, I'm the HR manager of XYZ company. And if I'm applying there, then I have a name. Um, LinkedIn also will give you shared contacts. Um, you can find people that know people that know people. So you can kind of figure out your uplink to that person as an individual and possibly if you're comfortable enough make those connections and see if someone can talk to them about the open position or just say, hey, I know my friend applied for this job. Maybe check out their resume, kind of give them a little bit of a nudge. 
Um, and that, all, that often helps. People like that interpersonal connection. We really do rely on the opinions of others. When was the last time you bought something on Amazon without at least checking out the review? So it's really no different in the job search market. We really wanna be solid when we're making those hiring decisions. You're gonna be spending 40 hours a week or more with the people in your office or interacting with them in some capacity. And you're way better off if you're happy with the people that you're working with and if you make those good decisions. Nobody wants to make a bad hiring decision. Every person that makes those decisions is nervous about that fact. They want to find the best person for the job. But ultimately, at the end of the day, we really want to connect as people. Update your profile. Take a look at all of your social media and Google yourself from a non, like a computer that you don't usually use if you can, um, a public computer or something like that. Because what's going to happen is, um, and, and I hear it all the time, a hiring manager, they get this resume and great, this person looks awesome. I'm gonna Google their name and then they see your picture from the Jimmy Buffett with two margaritas in your hand and um, that's their first impression of you. So make sure all of your social media, your LinkedIn, any, any way that you are out there on the internet is as professional as you can be um, and take those steps to to make sure that your profiles are, are up to date and reflect you in a light that you would like to be reflected. Also, find professional membership organizations within your industry if there are, um, and attend meetings or digital meetings. Um, I say a small investment can go a long way. Some of these professional organizations do require a membership fee, but a lot of them have job boards or regular meetings where you can meet people within your industry and help build those connections. So I think that that investment is, is well worth it. Um, get involved in your community. So the Chamber of Commerce, I get emails frequently. There's wonderful after hour events where you can explore different businesses. Um, get to know your Chamber of Commerce and their events and, and how they are active in your community. And, and that really can go a long way. Um, volunteering also. If you're someone that is looking for employment or maybe looking for employment, especially in the non-for-profit or, or any of those public service arenas, volunteering can go such a long way. Um, when I worked for Opportunity House, I was on their fundraising committee and we had like our band together events and everything. And, and I still attend those and, and help out where I can just because it's something that I'm passionate about, but it's also because I'm gonna meet a lot of people that have similar interests that are gonna be good connections for me in the future. Again, I highlighted a little bit on those professional organizations. They can be a really great tool to help you with your job search and actively seek others to help and connect. I like to really be positive and believe in the good in people and I believe that people generally want to help other people. So asking for a little bit of help and working with your network, um, you can make a really big difference and, and see a lot of change in a short amount of time. Okay, so this is a WGN little snippet. I hope I have time. I think I do. Um, so this is a little snippet about a, a local pizza place that really thought outside the box and how it benefited their business in a time that is difficult. Uh-oh. Did they change it? It's thinking. There we go. Hmm? Oh, okay. Let's see here. Now I'm in a basement commercial. Can you see the basement commercial? Okay, I might not be able to get this to work. 
it is working, but I don't have sound. And you can't see Marcus LaShock, right? No, and we can probably afterwards, Linda, paste this in the comments on Facebook so folks can go back and look at it as well. Great. Thank you. I'm not sure why. I mean, you saw every everything else when I linked to it, right? But you can always do that, right? I apologize. It is a really good feature little video. It's about three minutes long. There's a pizza place in Chicago, and I'm just going to summarize real quick. But there's a pizza place in Chicago that decided... Um, while they had to basically be only uh, doing delivery when we were in total shutdown, that they wanted to make a difference in their community. So they started delivering pizzas to all of the first line workers in, at the hospital. So they would just show up at the hospital with boxes of pizza to support the nurses and the doctors that were working on the front lines. Um, and suddenly business owners and other entities got word that they were doing this on their own and started asking to sponsor pizzas for the hospitals. So they would pay them money, tip the drivers very well, and kept sending pizzas to the hospitals in the areas to keep the workers at the restaurant working and also to you know support the front lines. And so it became this great marketing tool and the pizza owner shares at the end that he had to add additional positions because just this one act alone made such a difference that they couldn't keep up with the volume. So again, they planted the seed, they saw a need, they made a difference in their community and it turned around to give them jobs in the, in the community and profit that they never expected to yield. That wasn't the goal going in, but it, it was an excellent story. Um, and and I believe they're still doing it in Chicago. So that, that's what that's about. Um, I would like to give a little shout out to Kishwaukee College and our career services. Um, Amanda O'Hare, well, Amanda Cost, she was O'Hare. I was looking at her email. Amanda Cost, um, hopefully she's on here. Um, but she she's a great resource out of the college. Um, she does a lot of these workshops as well, and she works with students um, and connecting them with employers, as well as as you're looking to graduate, developing those resumes, mock interviewing, and just really helping people transition from school to employment. Um, and then our office, again, I'm Linda Kojin, and I'm the Employer Services Specialist. So I help people get connected with local employers in the community, as well as really focus on the job readiness side. And um, I oversee a program called On the Job Training, which pays half of the employee's salary to the employer in exchange for them getting training on the job. So um, that's kind of what I do. And then Nicole Spezio de Paz is my our coordinator here, and she, would be who you would contact if you would like more information about our services. Um, we can provide training up to $10,000 in an approved WIOA program. Uh, if you are below a certain income level or if you've collected unemployment within the, the last year or two, um, it kind of eligibility is, is something that we have to evaluate on an individual basis, but we would love to help people with, their, with our services and get them connected to training and employment resources. You and I. So Linda, thank you. I want to circle back on a couple comments if we can as, as people are typing in any questions that they have that, that I think are really important, um, especially as an employer in the area. A couple things that I've observed as I've hired people over the last couple of years and um, we, I, I've had the chance to see some really outstanding resumes and I've had a chance to see some that um, really they, they don't pass the muster and I cannot emphasize enough that yes your skill is is what's most important to you as you're as you're getting into that new job but in order to open that opportunity you got to have some some presentation uh, on that resume to get to get a call back to get an opportunity I know a lot of it is online right now um, and you usually upload that resume, but uh, show it to others. You know, Linda, I think you talked a little bit about having that reviewed by, by folks in, in your world and making sure that they have an opportunity to get some critical feedback and how the resume just appears. Um, I'll never forget there was a, 
there was an email on a, a job applicant resume that I got that was like uh, Jimmy's crazy grandma 231 and pay attention to the email address you're using, right? I mean, there's, there's some crazy email addresses out there that we just use for things that we don't want to get bombarded with in our email box, but make sure you're, if you're sending a resume out there, that, that that's not necessarily the one that, that you're putting out there. Absolutely. Um, I can tell a couple stories about that one. <laughs> some, some inappropriate ones. You know. We need to create something for some initial last name for you. <laughs> Absolutely. And you spent a lot of time talking about putting those newest things first. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think there's any problem as, as an employer, somebody who's, who's hired, you know, over the past 15 years. I don't think there's anything wrong with folks that, that have spent time with their family, you know, that have really taken time to spend time with the kids and, and are trying to get back into the workforce. And, and just to own that, own what you've done and, and, and make sure that there's not a gap in there because I would, as an employer, be more concerned if I see a gap with no explanation versus somebody who's put something in there that said, hey, listen, I took five years out of the workforce to make sure I was there for my family. And, and for me personally, that's a critical part of what we do in my household. And, and so I value that somebody would take that opportunity to spend time with, with their family where they could. I would also encourage people, and, and you mentioned this, Linda, and thank you for highlighting it, that you do put some details in there about a job. I've had so many people that have just put, you know, I worked at so-and-so and, and had no description of what they had done, uh, had no contact, the dates didn't match, and, and a whole bunch of issues like that. So that, again, goes back to what you had mentioned about having somebody else take a peek at it, kind of coach you through what the resume looks like so that that can be addressed before you really send it out there. Um, and, and one of the most important things that, that you hit on, Linda, that I want to go back to is, is talking about your time at Opportunity House and, and really focusing on those volunteer efforts that you do. Um, as a member of this community, I, I time and again run into people at – different volunteer events or fundraisers where uh, sporting events where, where parents have connected and then all of a sudden a couple years later those parents are working together right they had an opportunity they said hey you know what I met somebody who might just be perfect for this role so putting it out there in the world that, that you're looking for a job and kind of what you're looking for and connecting with your network and, and making sure people are aware is kind of half the battle because as people look back, they always have that mantra in their mind about, well, it's who you know that gets you the opportunity. And the more people that know that you're looking, the better opportunity you're gonna to have to, to kind of connect with that. And you alluded to two other things. And, and again, kudos to Kishwaukee College for everything you guys have done. But two things I wanna hone in on that you had mentioned, Linda, is be curious, always be asking, be seeking, be looking for that information. And, and be inquisitive when you're visiting with employers. Ask enough questions, show a level of interest. Uh, look up the place that you're applying online, see what the reviews are, uh, get a little bit more information so that, so that you're, you're being inquisitive about that is gonna lead to a better dialogue with that employer when the phone rings. So Linda, kudos and, and thank you. And, and uh, Tom, any comments? Yeah, actually, I, I think let's take this opportunity to, I really appreciate Linda's um, insight here. And we've got a couple of questions from some participants. So I, I'll tee those up and then Linda, you can, um, you can respond to those. So the first, uh, Kelly is asking, what's the most appropriate time frame for following up after submitting a resume for consideration? So how soon should you follow back? I call it your business day rule. So you submit a resume, you wait one business day for it to get on the person's desk, a second business day for them to review it, and you're calling the third. So if you submit a resume on Wednesday, wait Thursday, Friday, call Monday, maybe Tuesday, because sometimes Mondays go up very quickly for people. Everybody's going home well at the beginning of the week. Um, also consider timing. So I always use the restaurant example. If you're applying for a job at a, at a restaurant, do not call them at six o'clock on a Friday night to check up on your resume. That's a bad time. <laughs> so try to avoid like the noon hour um, and like right at four or five o'clock when somebody's about ready to get going because you don't wanna catch them at a bad time if you can. And if you do happen to catch them at a bad time, always ask when is a good time to contact you. Use a day planner. That write that down, set it like an appointment, and follow up when they tell you to, because that shows that you listen, 
and that you're organized and you're responsible to follow up with instructors. And, and great. That's, that's great feedback. Yeah, go ahead, Jeff. Yeah, let me dovetail on that because I think that follow-up component is so critical. I know there's some employers here in our area that won't even consider looking at you unless you've followed up, unless you've shown that initiative to then reach back out and make sure that you can connect with them. So thank you. We also have a question from uh, Rhonda, and she's talking about having some difficulty finding work in her current field um, and asking about uh, helping her find training in another field. So what advice would you give folks who maybe have gone through the process of um, sending out some resumes, but are just not satisfied with the current um, opportunities for the skill set that they have? Um, spend a little bit of time looking at your interests. The WorkNet has some great resources, some interest quizzes that you can take to, to kind of take a look at what your natural skills, abilities, and interests are and what areas you're successful in. We do a really thorough assessment of people when we're considering paying for their training where we walk them through that process, but it's something you can certainly do on your own. Be creative. Think outside the box. Take a look at what where what excites you and how can you move yourself in that direction? Because if it's something you're naturally able to do and you're naturally interested in, you're going to be more driven, more excited and, and get a better foundation in starting that, that new career. The road winds. There's not a straight line from point A to point B. The people that know, um, my husband's kind of one of them, but very few and far between are the people that wake up when they're 15 years old and say, I want to be an engineer. They graduate in four years. They start working. They retire from the same company. That doesn't happen as often anymore. And so you, you should shift and change as, as you grow and develop and, and always kind of be looking for the next week. And, and I want to dovetail on that again, Rhonda, it, or uh, yeah, Rhonda, if, if you are uh, looking to develop your skills and your qualifications in a particular field, there's absolutely nothing wrong with reaching out to a handful of people that are already in that field, that are doing it today and just saying, listen, I'm not necessarily applying for a job with you, or I know you're doing this. Can, can you get coffee with me and just kind of tell me a little bit about what you do and what I make? be able to do today to put myself in a better position to be able to do what you do, you know, next year or down the road. And I'd also like to say that you, sh you want to sometimes consider sometimes taking a slight step back or laterally isn't a bad thing because if it's going to bring you new skills in a new area. So I think a lot of people just want to be the executive director tomorrow. And it really is something that takes a lot of time to, to build like a career. So sometimes you may, might want to take a slight step back in responsibility in order to have different job roles, different job responsibilities, something that makes you happier. Because if you're happier in your position, if it's more conducive to your family life, you have better work-life balance, maybe even better benefits. There's a lot of reasons people should make changes, um, and it, it's a big picture. So don't be afraid to take a, a lateral move or even a slight step back because it can propel you further to climb a taller ladder. <laughs> yeah, I, I think there's, uh, you know, especially now with uh, the, the COVID world that we're living in, you know, Rhonda mentioned that COVID has really affected her opportunities, and people may be really reconsidering the work-life balance right now given some uncertainty with childcare or with school times, if you've got kids at home, you might be able, you might want to choose a job that has more flexibility in, in hours worked or, uh, you know, relationship with, with uh, your spouse or others in the home who are working. Um, but then also, you know, we've seen some, uh, you know, different sectors have responded differently to COVID. Some places are, you know, desperate to hire and scaling up as much as they possibly can. Other places have seen layoffs and reductions. Um, and it really is, a, a, you know, an industry by industry, you know, how they've been able to respond to this is, is very different. So uh, that, I think that's a, it's a very good point about if you're changing fields, there are a variety of, of reasons to do that and things that affect you personally, your own skill set, but also, you know, your job security um, or the, how well it adapts and fits your family's life. That's a big change from, you know, even what we had just, uh, you know, six months or a year ago. Uh, this this new world has made people reconsider a lot of those other aspects of the job, not just the title or just the uh, hourly pay rate. Mm -hmm. 
Any other questions that uh, folks have, uh, please feel free to type in, in the Q&A. Um, we've got a tip here, Nicole's, uh, the WIOAs can also help uh, pay to fill the skills gap, look into your county's WIOA offices. Uh, we'll send out this information at the end of the presentation. Fantastic, yeah, that's a, that's a very good tip and we'll share any of that, um, any of that information from, from Nicole. Yeah, Linda, will you talk a little bit there uh, about the length of resume? Um, the, there is definitely an issue with some of that, um, especially if you have a, a very uh, specialized field or, or lengthy work history. And Linda, I know you touched a little bit on having a CV and kind of separating a CV from a resume. Let's circle back around with that if you could. Sure, absolutely. Um, you know, you want to be able to get through the information and a brief amount of time. You're not going to capture your reader for five or 10 minutes reading every single bullet point. You really want to highlight and, and it's, it's an overview. And we need to keep that in mind. We want it to, to basically the, the point is, is to get them to want to meet you in person to kind of expand on your resume. It's, it's a marketing tool. It's, and you had highlighted earlier that a lot of times that's the first impression that you get is your resume. You'll see somebody in print before you actually meet them in person. Um, most of the time that's the case. So your application, if there's a job application, your cover letter and your resume are the first thing someone is gonna see um, and, and their first exposure to you. So we want it to, to grasp, but we also don't want anybody to feel overwhelmed that they're on information overload. Yeah, uh, that's that's a great uh, great perspective there. We also have a, a question um, from Laney about uh, as you're putting together that resume, should you have references included on the res resume or just uh, available if requested? Available if requested, um, and if you are if you don't have a lot of information on your resume, I have seen references available upon request on the bottom of the of the resume. Um, I. I don't have it and I generally it's kind of a filler it's implied that you should have them um, but I always if I am in an interview situation I actually have a little portfolio that I upkeep it, it was started in college um, it was my my like capstone portfolio for my degree um, and I had a couple of really good projects and then I've just always included like work samples I did a newsletter for a while um, any certifications that I get, I have color copies of my degrees, my letters of recommendation, and then my references sheets, all available. I bring that to an interview situation. So if somebody wants to see it, I have it right there to share it. Um, some positions are degree required or certification required. I need to see a copy of that. So I actually have like my transcripts are in there. So if that's something that I needed for the job, I have it with me because you never know. You could have that on site. <laughs> We want you to start on Monday. What can you get us this information? So I have it in a, in a go-to file spot, and I bring it with me. Um, and, and then I make sure that my references know when I have an interview that they may be contacted. That I'm going to be sharing their contact information that day. And I will try to include them a copy of the, the cover letter that I sent for that position and the resume. Okay, Linda, can we go back to the prior slide that shows yours and Nicole's uh, contact information, just to have that up there if, if anybody has any questions along the way that um, maybe they can reach out. Um, so let's, let's talk a little bit if we can too, uh, see if there's any other questions before we wrap up. But Linda, talk a little bit about what you've seen as far as success with people utilizing their LinkedIn connections and how to set up a LinkedIn profile. I'm not admittedly the biggest expert on LinkedIn. I do use it um, personally and a little bit professionally, but um, I have a lot to learn and I'm, I'm trying to. But LinkedIn really, they have their own job search feature. You can search for keywords. There's a, actually a secondary app for LinkedIn jobs. Um, so companies are able to put their postings on LinkedIn. But I really do use it to search for people that maybe work for that company. Mm -hmm. um, to try to get a feel for who they've hired and kind of their professional experiences, um, get a little bit of an idea. And then if there is a mutual connection, then maybe ask some questions um, that way. And, and I 
you want to represent yourself personally and professionally um, as best as you can and just really read through that the information is accurate and spell checked and representing you well. Good. Well, there's a question from uh, Amanda. Um, how much time do you think employers take when initially looking at a resume? Do you have to make a two second impression or do they give a little bit more thought to it? Um, it that is very individual in my experience. I help people write resumes for a living, but when I was in Opportunity House as a manager, I did a lot of hiring and our department's goal was to help people with disabilities get jobs. So my job coaches better submit a pretty decent resume because they're going to be helping other people write them. <laughs> so I was a little bit more critical. HR generally is going to be a little more critical of resumes than some of the hiring people, but it's, it's, it's very individual. Um, I want to make sure that you can wade through the content in under about two minutes for anybody. And I, one thing I didn't say that I frequently do when I'm meeting with people in person and reviewing resumes is you want the secretary at the front desk to be able to read your resume and have a good understanding of what it is that you do and your qualifications, as well as the executive director of the organization to be impressed by it. So make sure that your language is easy to understand. Um, you can use and should use some industry specific, but if you're using abbreviations, spell it out first, then put it in parentheses next to it. And then if you use that abbreviation again, then you can, you can do it by abbreviation. But make sure that it's really clear and understandable at, a mul at multiple levels, that nobody really has any questions and they don't have any idea what it is that you did. Um, the, the tendency is for people to use wording that makes them come off as really, really smart and important, but sometimes we lose people um, and we really want to make sure that you're making a, a professional impression, but um, that everybody has a good sense of what you're capable of doing. Well, and let's spend some time talking about that too, Linda. You hit in something and, and you said that that receptionist looking at your resume should be able to digest it. Also, folks, please be as kind as you can to that receptionist taking the phone call from you when you call in to talk to them about the job. Uh, time and again, they're the gatekeeper, right? And, and if they've got a bad gut instinct about you or what you're going to tell them or how you're acting... Uh, you're, you're on, you're on stage when you're talking to the person that first picks up the phone and they're going to give feedback to that employer or that HR person. So just be aware if you're reaching out that, that you don't necessarily need to get past the gatekeeper as quickly as possible. Sometimes you want to engage that gatekeeper, that receptionist, that HR person to paint a good picture and to be an advocate for you with that place of business. Absolutely. Yes. Um, uh, and there's a really old video, and I, we, I have it on VHS, but it's called Dialing for Jobs. I'm sure it's probably available on YouTube somewhere, but it really hits that point home of how to ask the right questions and build a rapport with those, with those crucial gatekeepers. You know, ask for a name, and so next time when you call back, you can specifically ask for that person. Oh, they're unavailable right now. Okay, could you possibly advise me an excellent time to call back? You know, be very polite and just kind of ask general questions, but try to narrow it down. And that way you, you kind of take those little hints that you can, you can get through the gatekeepers to the people that you need to talk to. Okay, well, we are coming up on 11 o'clock. Um, we see one more uh, suggestion here on interviews. I think that would be a fantastic copy, uh, topic for another time. I think that, yeah. that there's a lot of people that uh, get nervous during those job interviews and, and we can probably share some tips and tricks on how to do that. So let's, let's work after this to try to do that for, uh, for the folks listening. I would um, be happy to. And also if anybody would like to do a mock interview with me, um, or that's a big part of the services that we can provide here is feedback on your resumes, mock interviewing, all of those services. I'm happy to do that. Um, if you really want intensive services, we'll have you fill out the LEOA application, which is on, on the link to the left here. Um, but I, I'm happy to give advice whenever, however, um, email in this situation is probably the best way to get me, but the phone number listed does forward to my cell phone when I'm working remote. So either way, I'm happy to answer questions from anybody attending today. 
Awesome. Well, I, I appreciate everybody uh, participating today. I've been uh, Representative Jeff Kiker. Tom, I'll hand it over to you for some closing comments. Yeah, thanks very much. And, and thank you, Linda, and, and your staff who have been participating in this as well. Uh, this is a great resource to have right at Kishwaukee College and really can benefit quite a few folks within the, the broader area. Um, so we appreciate your expertise and professionalism in this. And uh, again, I hope this is the you know, maybe putting people in contact with a resource that they can use, you know, now and in the future, refer to friends. If you're not looking for a job right now, it's probably a good time to make a note of some of these things because you never know uh, when you might be in the future. So thanks again, uh, Linda, for all your uh, insight and, and uh, knowledge on this topic. And uh, thanks, Jeff, for, uh, for teeing up on this. This is great to be able to work together to, to share this information with Amen. our communities. You betcha. Thank you all. Appreciate it. Please reach out as we can be helpful.